I guess I would start by saying that um, you know the topic I want to take up is um, somewhat related in the sense that um, it deals with the whole issue of um, what happens to privacy in this kind of, of world. Um, what, um, you know, what, what tools are available to us um, in order to, in some sense, determine what of our personal data we get to keep personally as our own versus um, what kind of data we choose to share with others and under what conditions. But first of all, I am, I mean, first time you do this is always the tricky one, okay? I'm from SMR. Um, quick show of hands, how many people know who SMR is? Oh, so I don't have to go into this, all the numbers on this slide, that's great. Uh, how many members? Oh, I got work to do, okay. All right, but you all know who we are, so we'll uh, spare that, okay. So um, part of what you know, we've done, I mean, we're 70 years old, right? And, um, and part of what we've done, and a major part of our mission, is to generate guidelines that describe the ethical and professional behavior to be expected of, uh, of market researchers, insight professionals, whatever the term is that we choose to, uh, to use. And um, if you look, you know, this is just, I quick put this together really quickly, but on the site there are currently 23 of these things. They are in various uh, states of updating. Um, some of them I would tell you never even look at and pay attention anymore. Um, so this is a huge problem we have of trying to keep up as the methodologies and the data sources that we use continue uh, to expand. But in 2015, it became clear to us that we really needed to go back to the basis for all this, which is the ICC SMR code, which is basically the code of conduct for members of the association. And, and, and what we needed to do is we needed for it to recognize the way in which our industry um, was changing. And it really gets to some of the issues, although nowhere near into the future as far as John went, but some of what's happening right now which is suddenly we live in this data-rich world, which presents both opportunities for us as researchers, but also creates some threats and some issues that we're going to have to deal with here um, over the next few years. So for example, um, having all this personal data, much of it behavioral is a terrific advantage because we, we don't have to go and collect it, basically. Right? It's already existing. We've also seen over the last few years that um, tools which you know, five or six years ago we would have thought were way too sophisticated for simple market researchers such as ourselves, these tools now are going mainstream. We now have the capacity, the technical capacity to be able to handle these data sets and we have the tools to analyze them. Uh, and finally, uh, there is I think a general recognition that having all this data and being able to work with it and analyze it is a really good thing for the societies and the economies in which we all live. But there's no free ride here. And so we have a couple of three issues that kind of go hand in hand with these benefits. Number one is this whole business of privacy, which as we'll see in a bit, at this point in time at least, is really important to people. And they're very conscious of the fact that it is under assault. Um, secondly, um, in terms of what we do, in the sense that we go out often and, and actually talk to people, um, there's a real trust issue. And people do not want to talk to us. They don't cooperate like they once did. And that's, that's a problem that we have to deal with. And in particular, we have to deal with is people don't really always understand the difference between research and what's not research, between collecting information as part of a research project versus collecting information in order to use it for targeted marketing or some other uh, kind of purpose. And then finally, uh, regulatory requirements emerging all over the world, which are designed to respond to people's concerns about their privacy, but may make it more difficult for us to do what it is that we do. And you know, some of the risks were there all along, but what's really happened is over the last several years, um, we've had this, this emergence of these algorithms which are part of automatic, this automated decision-making systems. And these systems are capable of using a lot more data about us than what we're used to. Say, for example, when you go and apply for a mortgage. There's a lot more that goes into that decision on the part of the lender now than before. So, we, so that's a real issue. Getting the data that powers these systems, um, it really gets us to the edge of some important ethical issues. So what do we have? We have an incredibly targeted uh, marketing. 
that goes on now. You look at this whole controversy currently going on in the political space about micro-targeting and just how specific that can be. We have concerns about loss of opportunity, about people being denied jobs <laughs> because of models that tell an employer what kind of person they want, what kind of person they don't want. Economic loss, for a long time we've had this issue, for example, of how people get credit. Those algorithms have become increasingly more sophisticated in terms of predicting who's going to pay and who's not going to pay. There's just social issues just in terms of detriment, in terms of being um, pounded by marketing. And of course, in some cases, even loss of liberty, the surveillance that results in people <coughs> ending up in prison, like the prison terms determined by kinds of information that in the past weren't available to judges when they made those decisions. Uh, people know what's going on, and they don't like it. So this is um, the results of a survey done by GRBN back in 2014, 24 countries. How concerned are you that your personal data may be misused? And you can see, if you just lump in concerned and very concerned and concerned, um, that there's not much left over of people who are not concerned. The Americas um, look a lot um, like the Asia Pacific region. Um, the Europeans are a little more comfortable because perhaps they historically had better data privacy legislation. This is a repeat of that study in 2018 and um, asked another question basically about how people feel about market researchers having their data. Do they trust market researchers with their data compared to all these other entities that presumably have the data? And we don't look very good here, 27%. The closer you get to social media, the worse it is. And you know we're, we're alarmingly close to, to uh, social media on that scale. And then just recently, um, a couple weeks ago, and, and, um, and, and Marcus let me update my presentation and not deliver it on time so I could get this data in, uh, a Pew study um, looked at a lot of these same issues. And so here are some of the results. You know, Americans are as fed up as everybody else. 72% believe anytime they go online, there's companies tracking what they do, right? Another almost 80% um, saying that they're concerned then about how the state is getting used. You can read these as well as I can. 60% they don't have no clue what people are doing with this data, but we suspect it's not very good. Um, very few people think they have control over their personal data of all this data that's being collected. And when the, the, the shy thing to me, right, is this business, 81% saying that the benefits, the potential benefits, outweigh the risks. Uh, a bit more data. Um, social media, you know, who, who are they worried about having their data? Social media sites, that's not a surprise to any of us in the heels of Cambridge Analytica. Um, they know that the advertisers, um, you know, that message comes across every time they go online that advertisers know a lot about what they do. It's sort of interesting, I don't have the data here, but they asked if, if they'd gotten targeted ads and whether those targeted ads represent their interests. An astounding number of people said, oh yeah, they do represent my interests, right? I mean, people do, these advertisers do understand me. And as you can tell, that does not make me all that comfortable. I don't like, I look at the camera, I'm thinking camera because there's a guy sitting in front of me with a camera, <laughs> on Amazon, and then that camera follows them around the, the internet for the next week or so, every site they go to. People find it creepy, people don't think much about it in terms of, uh, of when they look at the camera, but recognize that this is a result. And then you've got law enforcement and their employer, and it's sort of odd friends and family, it says something about the society we live in, I guess, that 40% of these people don't want their friends and family to know what they're all about. <laughs> But that's another issue. But what all this translates into is this plea for some sort of regulation, um, some sort of way so that there's limits to what it is people can do with my personal information. And it's surprisingly the same across party lines. Here's something completely different, but just before we uh, move on from looking at all this data, which is a study that was done by SMR in connection with Cadence, three countries represented here, the UK, the US, and India. And this is of uh, marketing execs, CEOs, um, um, IT guys, um, people like that. And what it shows is a certain ambivalence 
you know, on the part of the people who are actually holding this data, right? So almost half are saying businesses share data too freely with third parties. Other companies in our industry are not doing enough to protect their data, 50%. Data should be more strictly controlled in my organization. There should be minimum standard level of data protection in all companies. 86% of, the of, of these execs say that that is uh, the case. So one result of that phenomenon is the GDPR. Assume everybody knows what the GDPR is. If you don't, you probably shouldn't be here. Um, is going global. Not in the sense that everybody's you know, taking it to the Xerox machine. Obviously, we don't have Xerox machines anymore. <laughs> but, um, but in the sense that the underlying principles of the GDPR are being adapted on a, on a wide scale globally. But the most um, obvious representation of that here in the US is the CCPA, the California law that goes into force at the end of uh, this month. So these are just a few of the places where, um, where um, GDPR lookalikes um, are, are coming online. In the US, for some while now, we've had this unfortunate situation where in the absence of a meaningful national privacy law, states are out doing their own things. So one of the words you hear when you talk about the US is the word preemption, which basically means if we had a federal privacy law that took precedent over all this, then doing research would be a lot easier. Some of you probably are in this box where you're trying to do or national studies and you're dealing with individual state laws that mean that there are certain things you can't do in this state, but you can do in another state. Um, people are doing globally. Global work have had this problem for a long, long time. But it's now a US problem as well. And what this translates into, in a lot of people's minds, certainly in the minds of those who are holding all this data, is now we've got all these regulations we have to deal with and all this stuff we have to comply with. So we've got documentation requirements. We've got staffing requirements, um, new contracting requirements in terms of you know, when we're sharing data, say, with subcontractors, um, new reporting requirements, and the possibility out there that um, if we get caught in a data breach or something similar, it could cost us a ton of money. So there's a study, and I wish I had um, a better memory. Um, IITF, I forget. John may know what that stands for. What does that stand for, John? No? OK. Um, the, one of the I's is for innovation. The F is for foundation. But the point is they did oh, a technology and innovation. Very good. Thank you. Um, and, um, uh, and so they did a study. They said, what is all this, something like the CCPA, what's it going to cost the economy? It's going to cost the economy $122 billion a year. And so, whoa, that's a lot of money. This is all compliance costs. Turns out when you look at the numbers, no, it's not. Um, a little bit of it is compliance costs, new hardware and software, uh, data protection officers, things of that sort. But 85% of it goes into all the complexity they have to deal with if they're required to get consent, if there are restrictions on how they can share data with other people. Um, these kinds of issues, which really get down to um, the profitability of doing what we're currently doing, which is collecting data, in many cases surreptitiously, on a very broad scale, and sharing it all over the place. And that's the sort of problem that um, a lot of people, as you've just seen, are really concerned about. So think about market research for a minute. One of the things about market research, over the years at least, and this may go by the boards in, in John's world, is we have always said we're a self-regulating organization, or industry, rather. And what that means is that we do things which are above and beyond what is required by law out of respect for the people whose data we rely on in order to do the work that we do. And so it's not enough to simply be compliant, because that puts us in the same box with everybody else. If part of your strategy is to go to the regulators and say, hey, look, here's our, here are our codes. Here's how we operate. We don't take direct action against people, as we used to say. We're not engaged in commercial speech. 
then there are exceptions that are given us. The most famous exception in the US is being accepted from the um, do not call legislation passed in the, um, the late 90s. And in the case of the GDPR, uh, we've won a couple of exceptions. One really important one, which is there's this thing called the, um, uh, um, the um, oh my, forgetting the name, copyright director, which basically says um, you go on Facebook right now or in Twitter and you say, I'm listening to this bozo talk about privacy and I wish we could talk about something else. That, you, have, you own the copyright to that now. All right, and if I, want to, if I want to access and use that data, then I've got to deal with you in order to do that. And so SMR and other European partners are successful in convincing them that this is, um, th this is not what we do. We don't work at the individual level. We're not interested in individuals. What we're interested in is being able to analyze a broad uh, set of data without identifying individuals. And in that context, then the whole business that, that Ramesh does, for example, um, is saved. Otherwise, that kind of puts them out of business. Similar issue at the moment, the EU is looking at a cookie directive, which could outlaw third party cookies. Now, from an advertising point of view, tough shit advertisers. You're not going to be able to do this. You're not going to be able to collect data on us anymore without us knowing. But it also would shut down programmatic sampling. And so it's important for us to be able to go and make an argument that we work at a higher level code than the rest of the world, and therefore we should be granted an exception. Um, there are other things I could go on, but let's stop there for the moment. So, um, so one way to look at this is privacy by design, which is a concept introduced in the early part of this century. And the whole idea is that everything you do, the questions you're asking yourself, um, what are the privacy risks to the individuals whose data I'm dealing with um, when I go about doing my work in this particular way? And you don't make compromises. You don't say, yeah, but it costs a little more, or yeah, but it takes a little longer. You don't make those compromises. You know, privacy is always a default mode. Everything you do in your, in, your, in, your, um, in, in your work. And then there's a newer concept, which is sort of interesting, uh, the notion of data dignity. Little pie in the sky. But um, nonetheless, the notion here is your data has value. And right now, you're not realizing that value. But there's a lot of other people who are making lots and lots of money off that data. And so you, what you need to think about is the economics of the internet. Well, you know the argument, right? Your personal data given to me is allowing you um, to have all these other great benefits of the internet. It's this unspoken deal that we're part of. Um, whereas the data dignity concept says, no, we have to recognize that that has value and that has dollar value. And so the economics of the internet need to be thought about differently um, than we have thought about them up until this point in time because of this massive harvesting of personal data. And there's a fascinating guy, uh, Jerron Lanier. If you Google him, um, He's got a great piece in um, last year in the Harvard Business Review. Um, he's kind of an unusual guy. Um, and the great video um, that you can also find um, that he did. Um, well, he's, done a, he's got a TED Talk and all that stuff. But have a look at him because he's really interesting. But the point is, for our point, from our point of view, in our industry, compliance is not enough. So a couple of practical suggestions. One of the things that the GDPR requires is something called um, a DPIA, um, a, da a, a data privacy impact assessment. We're promoting this notion that it's something that should be done in the US. Four simple steps, right? You're doing a project. Look, where's the, where's the data flowing? Who's going to have access? Where are the leaks that could result in some um, comprom compromise of people's data privacy? Um, once you know those leaks, how severe are they? then go ahead and design some remediation, some change in your process, and go ahead and implement those. And then you, know, you do this over and over again, and pretty soon your company has a pretty good way of going about doing the kind of work you do without creating privacy risk for those whose data you're using. Um, the, um, I always get the two C's and the D's mixed up. The organization or economic and cooperative development. 
as a set of privacy principles. You can go to their website and see them. And these are the basis for most of the, glo of the data protection legislation worldwide. And they have eight privacy principles. Limit the amount of data, personal data you collect to just what you need. That's actually two. Um, be clear about the purpose at the time of collection, uh, which is really important in data privacy legislation. Um, only use the data to fulfill that purpose or other compatible purposes. And we could have a whole half hour, hour on what constitutes compatible purpose, but I'm not going to drag you through that. Um, but this is another example where, um, at least in Europe, within the GDPR, this whole issue of uh, compatible purpose for market research just kind of goes away because what it says is that in Article 89 is that research is by definition a compatible purpose. So um, another one of those advantages of having a good, strong self-regulation argument to make to regulators. Um, implement security standards. Be clear about how personal data is protected and used. Be open with individuals about the data we hold. And then be accountable for the above. Whoops, wrong direction. Now, we're fortunate in that we've got a long history of knowing what to do in what we call primary data collection. That is to say, when you actually interact with someone, um, whether it's on the telephone, whether it's online, however we do that, have a focus group, whatever, right? We know what the rules of the road there are, and they've been there forever. We obtain consent. We're com transparent about what we're going to, kind of information we're going to collect, what it's for, how it'll be protected, whom it'll be shared, and in what form. In theory, every time you do a survey, that's something you're doing. Every time you do a focus group, you're putting those conditions in front of the people who you want to use in that focus group. The harder th part of this is what to do with what we're calling secondary data. And secondary data here, not kind of what you usually think of. Secondary data means data collected by someone else for some purpose other than research. But then it's useful to us, and so we want to try and use it in research. Social media is one obvious example. Um, first party data that clients are collecting about their customers are another kind of that data. Um, and so, you know, what should the rules of the road be? Because these are, this is tremendously valuable stuff for us, and how can we do this in an ethical way that's fair to the people whose data we're using? And so, the, the first thing that comes up is this whole thing about um, compatible purpose. And there's also a, 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 a uh, a legal concept called legitimate interest, which again, I won't go into, but there are ways of, of sort of working that through in the case of first party data. The big thing, the hard thing, the thing that goes against much of what's happening today is that making sure the data was collected with the knowledge of the person who owns that data. And that's what's not happening. And so if you're a researcher and here's a data set, your client wants to analyze it, one of the things you got to do, right, is you got to find out what are the terms of service, what were people told, now, is this valid, did they at least have a reasonable belief that data was being collected on them before I go ahead and use it. And then you have to make sure that what you're doing with it is not going to result in some kind of harm. Think of harm, think back to those things I showed at the beginning of all the kinds of risks that we take with personal data and the bad things that can happen to people. And the big worrisome one is always targeted marketing. Historically, there's been a bright red line between research and marketing. Research and sales. Um, it's important we maintain that line. So, okay. Um, this quote is from the, uh, the Casero Code. You all remember when there was a Casero? Yeah, Council of American Survey Research Organizations, uh, which I think three years ago merged with uh, the MRA to form the Insights Association. Research participants are the lifeblood of the research industry. And once you, t once you believe that, once you put that out there as a principle, then the way in which you treat them um, has to reflect just how important they are. The challenge now is to figure out, okay, how do we, have, how do we translate that principle into the world in which we now live, this data-rich world, data is being collected crazy, like 
like all over the place. Yeah. Um, I, how do we translate that in terms of rights the right behavior for us? We know already, I hope, we all understand from looking at the data, we have a trust problem. We don't stand out in people's minds anymore than, you know, barely better than social media. Um, so the, um, the, the, the GDPR is going global. Um, something like it sooner or later is going to come into all of our lives. Um, and in that case, we know that um, compliance is not going to be enough for us. Um, if we want to continue to argue for exceptions to things that get to the heart of our business, then we had, been, had damn well be able to make those arguments in good faith. Uh, we, we have really a long-standing history of programs of self-regulation that are based on transparency, that are based on openness and respect for people. We can't give those up and indeed need to find ways to translate them into this new world. Privacy by design is one way to do this. Um, the whole data dignity concept is another, but it's, a, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's on the time, same time scale John was talking about in terms of you know, how long does it take you to really change the whole economic model of how the internet works. Um, so thanks for listening. There's my email address. Um, feel free to contact me if you have any questions or concerns. I guess this is the point you say, do you have any questions now you would like to ask me? Yeah. Uh, I was, you mentioned um, your, um, at the bottom of one of your recent pages about how it should not lead to harm. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what you mean by harm? Harm. Um, you know, if I, were, if, if I had the kind of memory I wish I had or you gave me a few minutes, I would look it up because when we redid the SMR code in 2015, um, harm was a really important um, definition for us. Um, and I think, but basically, probably the best way to think about harm um, is all the things, whoops. I had a page, didn't I, where I talked about the, <coughs> yes, okay. This is a pretty good definition of harm. These are the components of harm. All right, now there's, there's a whole other set of things for those of you who have been doing this business a long time when it's face to face. You know, you also got these issues like, um, you know, if you're, you're doing a telephone study, don't talk to somebody while they're driving and things of that sort, right? So there's, there's, so there's that physical harm that comes into play here. But these are the kinds of things that, that when we talk about harm, we talk about financial costs, a uh, loss of one sort or another, that yeah, there was a time long gone since when you people um, have been in research where you, know, you worried about um, the cost of cell phone plans when you were calling people. We don't have that issue anymore. So there, there are a broad set of these things that, um, uh, that kind of harm. But this is a pretty good summary, at least, of what the categories are. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was just curious um, if you could talk more about that because when you think about it from like an ethical point of view, <clears throat> most of what we do in an industry that makes money is harm, right? We're selling unhealthy foods, we're selling sin categories, we're trying to get people's money when they may not have money to spend. So I'm just curious um, to, if you have thoughts on that. Oh, sure. Yeah, right. I mean, that's, you're talking now about um, the clients we choose to do work with. All right. Um, yeah. Yes. Right. Exactly. Or work for. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and which is, a, from my point of view, a, a much different issue. And I think, at least broadly, the company I worked for up until I retired in 2012, we had certain industries we would not do work for: tobacco, um, alcohol, and we shut down a whole thriving business we had doing lotteries. Um, so those are those are, I think, in most part, corporate level issues or. If it's your job, personal issues. Marcus has stood up, which is. <laughs>